David Price, Professor of uh, something to do with brains at Edinburgh University. He was educated in Edinburgh. Then he moved down, then he was desperate to get away. Why would anyone be desperate to get away from Edinburgh? I don't know. Anyway, he moved to Oxford, did his uh, degree, PhD in Oxford, and then spent some time in Berkeley, California, working with some smart Americans over there. And then, amazingly, he got a job offer to move back to, guess where? Edinburgh. Edinburgh. Okay, 30 years ago. And here he is tonight. And uh, he's going to come and tell us about the development of the brain. And, I mean, it is pretty amazing, however you look at it, how this thing inside our heads develops from basically just one fertilized egg. Nine months later, out pops a baby with a brain with like 10 billion neurons just waiting to get connected. Well, not just that, it's actually functioning. I mean, it's running the body. And all of this happens over a remarkably short period of time. And here we've got an expert to tell us how it all happens. David. Yeah, to be here. Um, it's a lovely city. I don't know very well, but uh, I love passing through it, and one, one day I, I thought I should stop, and here I am, stopped. <laughs> um, yes, this is great. Thanks very much for the invitation. Can everybody hear me okay? i put this microphone on. Yeah, if not, right. Great, so yes, I work on how the brain develops, um, and have done actually for the last 30 or more years, uh, and hopefully I will be able to show you why it's such an intriguing and really difficult challenge to try and answer how this thing that we all have inside us, which is the most remarkable uh, computational device you could think of, uh, comes into being. Okay, so I'm going to start by... Uh, just showing you a picture of the brain, I'm sure you've all seen it. Uh, it is a convoluted structure with a large surface area that's all bunched up. There's a lot of cells in it, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, and if we zoom in to the brain a bit, let's zoom in, make it a bit bigger, and uh, there we see the sulci and the gyri, which have these characteristic folds, which are actually remarkably similar between different people. Uh, and we go in a bit further... And then if we start to peel off the surface and look beneath, we start to see what's inside. We're going to see this network of cells. And here it is stylized. Each of these cells, which is an individual, almost like an individual organism that's capable of sustaining its own existence outside of the brain. We could take those cells out of the brain into a suitable culture medium and they would stay alive. So they're all linked together and working together like, like people on the planet, if you like. And they're stylized here, and you can see they've got these long processes that connect, and they have links between them which are lighting up, and those are the connections, what we call the synapses between them. That's where they communicate mm -hmm. with each other. Now, the number of cells in our brain is truly staggering. And actually, 10 billion is the number of neurons. The total number of cells is actually 100 billion, because a lot of cells in our brain are not nerve cells. They're actually uh, what we call glial cells. They provide support for the nerve cells and so on. So 10 billion, you know, that, that number probably doesn't mean much. It certainly doesn't mean much to me without some kind of context. So to think about numbers of that size, we're not very good at that sort of thing. Once we get above 10 or 100 or something, you know, we sort of just think, okay, 100 is quite big, and anything more than that is really big. So 100 billion, 1,000 billion, you know, these are, these are vastly different uh, numbers, but it's difficult to conceptualize them. So one of the ways that I try to get people to think about this is to think of each cell as a coin. And I know we don't see these very often these days. But there is a pile of, let's say, 100 or two coins. And the question uh, I could pose, and I, and I will pose, 
to you is how many coins do you think it would take to fill a double-decker bus? So if we have 100 billion cells in our brain, would 100 billion cells fill a double-decker bus? And helpfully, uh, here is a picture of a double-decker bus, <laughs> just in case you forgot what a double-decker <laughs> bus looks like, which I'm sure you have. So let's have a show of hands. How many people think that we could fill a double-decker bus with 100 billion coins? Yes, quite a few of you, right? Great. Uh, who thinks we could fill more than a double-decker bus? Yep, great, excellent, very good. So, shall I tell you how many more we can fill? I will. I will go to the punchline quickly and say it's that many. So 100 billion coins would fill this many double-decker buses. So that is a truly vast number. And they're all inside here in all of us, working away, those synapses are firing away, okay? I mean, it is truly remarkable how that was ever created, and it's created so reproducibly, every new child that's born is bringing a new one into the world. Another way to think about it is to think about, like I said, you know, and actually this is a theme that I'm going to use throughout this talk, is to think of the cells in our brain like people. Because in, in many ways that's actually quite a helpful analogy, to think of them like little people in there. So how many people is 100 billion? Well, it's 12 Earths worth of people. The planet has about 8 billion people on it. So if we have 12 of them, then we're getting into the realms of about 100 billion. So that is obviously a lot, a lot of people. And those people on the Earth are communicating with, with each other like the cells in our brain. Now, what do these cells actually look like? I showed you a fairly stylized uh, drawing a moment ago, a, 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 more than a drawing actually, a recreation if you like, a sort of three-dimensional one of all these cells in the brain. The person who actually started to draw those cells, saw them for the first time and drew them, was a really remarkable Spanish scientist called Ramon y Cajal. Uh, and he worked well over 100 years ago. Uh, to, to, he discovered stains that could pick out these cells and label them. And he made really drawings that are really, I think, you can view them as works of art. And this is just one of his many, many drawings of these nerve cells. So this is a pretty realistic drawing, uh, as opposed to the earlier one. And it allows me to make a few uh, comments on some features that hopefully you can see here. Uh, some detail in here. So like the earlier um, rendering that I showed you, we have the cell body in the middle, which is where the nucleus is, which contains all of the DNA and all of the, the uh, biochemistry of the cell. And then there are these long processes spreading out from it, like a tree. And we call them dendrites, which actually means branches. Now if you look carefully, you can see on these branches tiny little, they look like little buds. And th that's where the synapses are, where the communications from other cells are coming in. So just look at the number of them. Okay, and think about that for a minute. There are thousands of them on a cell. So that means that this cell, just this one cell out of the 100 billion, is getting communication from thousands of other cells. So how do we imagine this now? Now we're getting into truly astronomical numbers when we think about the numbers of connections. We are now into the hundreds of trillions of connections. So if you imagine um, an analogy here might be to think about your, your mobile phone. Now, I don't have that many contacts on my mobile phone because I'm kind of in the stage of my life where I didn't have a mobile phone when I was a youngster. And, you know, if I look at my kids' phones, they've probably got, I don't know, 500, 1,000 contacts. Goodness knows, some of you in this room maybe can up that number. Um, but the number of contacts we have, and if we all got our mobile phones out and started to contact all our contacts, maybe 500, 1,000 each, and we did that for 10 planets worth of people, that basically is an analogy for what's going on inside our head. That is the number of connections, the amount of activity that's going on. So 
we need to understand then how, the question that I've always been fascinated by is um, how do we get there? How, do, how was that ever created? How did that come from the single cell? Okay, so let's go back for a minute to this drawing here of Ramoni Cajal and think about how this might have come about. And, and we know that when this cell was very, very young and newly born, this one cell, it would have basically been a cell body. It would have been a round cell sitting in the fetal brain way back in the few, first few weeks of life. It would be a little cell with a nucleus in the middle, much the same size as that cell body. And then it's going to start to grow these processes. That's what happens. And that would happen during the first, second trimester of life. These neurons are going to... By the way, most of your neurons are born by birth. Just maybe I should say that. So the neurons that you're carrying in your head were born when you, before, you, before you were born. They were made and they stayed with you for your life. So... That, that would initially, way back in the early embryo, have been a small cell, and it would have grown these processes. Now, they can't just grow randomly. They have to grow in some sort of purposeful way. I mean, we don't randomly make connections with our mobile phone. We make connections with people we know, or people we'd like to try and contact or stay in touch with. So there are reasons for it. And these growing uh, processes have to do the same. They have to figure out somehow, what are they going to connect with? And that is a really big problem. If there's a hundred billion of you, how do you do that? Well, we don't know the answer to this, right? I'm not going to be able to give you answers to these questions. I'm putting them out there. But I'm going to show you, I hope, some of the, the cues and the clues that these growing processes use to navigate to meaningful places in the brain. So how do they actually do their navigating when these cells start to produce these branches? How do they actually do it? Well, they do it by having at their tips a structure like this. Now, this is about two microns across. So that's a tiny, you, you'd have to have a very high-powered microscope to see it. And this is what you would see at the end of one of these branches coming out from this growing cell. And we call this a growth cone. And you can see it's got these, like these, thing, it looks like a hand. And that is probably the best way of thinking of it. It's a hand that's exploring its environment. And what it's doing is it's sending feelers out. And it's judging where to go. So let's look at one that's living. Uh, this is a living one that's in a culture dish. So the background here is mottled just because that's the surface of a culture medium. Okay, this is all on its own, isolated. Like I said, cells from the brain can live in isolation, uh, and it's isolated. And the cells somewhere off the bottom of the screen, and it's growing this growth cone. So let's make it move and let's see what it does. So you can see what it's doing. It's extending up the screen, and you see how it's. Like these finger protrusions are exploring. Now, something's been added. Slit appeared at the top left. Okay? So what the experimenter has actually done is added a substance that exists naturally in the brain, which the growth cone doesn't like. And what researchers have done is to discover that there are substances in our brain which growth cones like and substances they don't like. So initially it was growing fine, then this what we call a repulsive or a chemo-repulsive substance has been added, and it makes this growth cone collapse. So we think part of the navigation is by growth cones sensing areas of what they like, areas they don't like. But of course that puts back the questions to, well, what makes areas likable or not likable? It just pushes the question one bit further back. So, we have a scenario there where um, the, the, uh, these connections are made by growth cones, but what gives the growth cones the knowledge, it's the substances that are there, but what distributes the substances in a way 
that makes sense. So the answer to all questions of how does development happen is this. It's a combination of your genes and your environment. So I'm going to spend quite a bit of time talking about genes and then a little bit of time talking about environment. And the reason I'm going to do it that way is because genes play a very large part in setting up these cues or these clues, if you like, which growth cones and other events that happen during development that, that are used by them um, to create the brain. And then at the end I'll say something about environment because you can connect the brain up but that doesn't mean it's working properly. We need to actually interact with our environment and learn from it in order to get the full potential from our brain. And a lot of that happens after birth. So although I'm telling you that the nerve cells are put there before birth, the connections are made before birth, the use of them and the way that the brain uh, matures and refines itself is very much after birth. Okay, so... Let's go on then and think a bit about genes. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever been to uh, the Wellcome Trust building in London. They're Wellcome Trust, a major funder of medical science in the UK. This is a bookshelf that is there, and that bookshelf contains that many books, and what is written in those books is our genetic code. So our genetic code is about 9 billion uh, bases long, and here it is. I mean, it's not enthralling reading. I've actually uh, had a look at it. And uh, it is just basically GATC repeated in some sequence. But that is the code of life. Now, the remarkable thing about this uh, genome that we possess, and other animals too, is that most of it seems to be completely redundant. There is a very small percentage of it, around 2-3%, which codes for the proteins that make up our bodies. There's more of it that, can, that codes for important molecules of other types, but the vast majority of it is of unknown function. Some people call it junk DNA. Personally, I'm not sure that's a great name for it, because it might not be junk. Um, but it's, it's a bit pejorative. But um, anyway, here it is in all its glory. So that is the code that contains the information that lays down the structure of the brain that these growth cones are going to use to connect up the cells so that we can function, essentially. This is where it all starts from. So how, is, how does that work? Because, you know, that we have these protein coding genes um, and every cell of our body has the same or just about the same, DNA. But the point is that different cells use different bits of the genome. And that's what makes them different. So different cells will use different proteins to different ends, and then they'll be different to another set of cells. So we can already see that, just like in humans, we can see differences. We can see differences among us, you know, maybe depending whether world we come from, what our ethnicity is, etc., etc., we can categorize the cells of our brain in the same way that we can attempt to categorize people. And when I say we can categorize cells of our brain, I mean we can attempt to categorize cells of our brain, because it's just as difficult as it is to categorize people. Categorization is difficult at the best of time, but obviously it becomes more so when you're dealing with complex objects. So, let's go to the embryo then, and this is a picture of uh, early first trimester human embryo here, uh, and it would be a few millimeters across at this stage, and you can see the eye quite clearly there, the head uh, up there to the, at the top left, and the brain is forming in there. Now, if I was to take away the surface and we look beneath, then we'll see the nervous system. And this is the developing nervous system. The nervous system develops really early in the fetus. And this is why people are very concerned about not exposing early pregnant mothers to various potentially harmful substances because this is the stage at which the nervous system is really starting to form. 
very, very early. So we have the brain over there in red, and that's the bit that's going to make the cerebral hemispheres, which are these walnut-like convoluted structures that lie beneath the skull. This is going to be the spinal cord, this brute, uh, brown bit here, and then all these different colors in the middle are the bits of your uh, hind brain here at the back of your head, the midbrain above it, the cerebellum would form up there, and these green areas are areas that are situated deep within the center of the adult brain. And you may wonder, well, why are they behind the brain at this stage? What's going to happen is that that red bit is going to get enormous, and it's going to engulf the green bit. It's going to outgrow it, and that green bit is going to vanish into the middle. We call that green bit the thalamus, and although the name really doesn't matter. What's more important is that that green bit is where all the information from the external world will eventually end up coming into that green area, from your skin, from your eyes, from your ears. It all funnels into that green area before it's then transmitted to the red area, which is your cerebral cortex. So those connections have to be made. And this is a model that we've used for a long time to try and understand, you know, just to focus in on one set of connections, just try and learn how one set of connections has been made. We focus on connections between that green area and that red area and ask, how do they get there? How do connections coming in and bringing all this sensory information into your brain, how do they get from the green bit to the red bit? Okay, now I'm going to tell you a little bit here about work that we've done over the last decades. And much of my work is actually focused on just one gene. And it, and it feels somewhat disappointing to say that after 30 years of work, I've managed to get to the bottom of what one gene does when there are 20,000 of them. But, you know, small, small differences can, can matter. Uh, and it's no... It's a lot of work to figure out what a gene does. Uh, it's, it's, it's easy to find a gene. It's very difficult to actually figure out what it does. Uh, and the gene which I have uh, basically been besotted with, if you like, for 30 years, uh, is a gene which is called Pax6. And, I mean, the name doesn't matter, and it's not related to anything Latin to do with Pax or Peace or anything. Um, this gene encodes a protein which regulates the DNA. And that's why it's one of a set of very interesting uh, uh, proteins which particularly interested people at the time. When I went to Berkeley back in the 80s, the reason I went there was because this type of gene had just been discovered. People had just discovered that there were hundreds of genes like this in the genome and their function was to control other genes. Now, genes that control other genes are pretty interesting because they have the potential to be quite high up in the hierarchy. You know, it's like studying the leaders of countries. We can see the flow of history by studying, you know, certain key individuals who control things at certain times. It's a bit like that. So this gene, anyway, PAC6, has been my obsession. Now, how do you study what a gene does? Uh, and, uh, and incidentally, the, the color scheme here is not coincidental because that gene is expressed in that region, which is why I've made it red. So PAC6 is expressed in this brain region and not in the green bit. So you can maybe start to see where this might be going because I said I was interested in how you connect up the green bit to the red bit. And, and you know, the green is there to indicate that's a different type of cell. It doesn't, for example, it doesn't express PAC6. There are many other differences too. The red ones express PAC6, and there are other differences too. So we could make the hypothesis, if you like, that PAC6 is somehow making that red bit different to the green bit. From a high level of control, it's telling that bit, you are different to the green bit. You will make different proteins you will make different guidance molecules. You will make attractive guidance molecules that will pull connections from the green bit into the red bit. 
but you're not going to make repulsive ones because we want those connections to come in. Something like that, okay? And the other colors that you see here are just but there by way of indicating that these different regions express different sets of genes too. But obviously, I'm just focusing on this one bit right at the highest level of the brain. Okay, so how do you set out to figure out how it, what a gene does? Well, the obvious thing to do is to remove it and see what happens. I mean, that's not a particularly staggeringly innovative thing to do, but it is a very standard way to get started to try and figure out what it does. If you take it away and you see something change, you can suppose that that gene has something to do with that process. So we did that. We mutated the gene. Now, we didn't do this in humans, obviously. Uh, we did it in mice, and it turns out that these genes are highly conserved in all species. So nowadays, you can uh, uh, do a lot of genetic engineering with mice. You can remove genes. You can duplicate genes, all sorts of things. Um, those technologies have been used for decades now. Uh, and we did that, we removed the gene, and we asked, what effect does it have? So we, have, we took the brain, after we removed the gene, we have the control, which is normal, and we have the brain in which PAC6 has been removed, and we took the cells out, and we separated them into their, into, into, so we had thousands and thousands of individual cells. And then we sequenced them to see what genes they were expressing to see if we could learn something about what was happening to these cells by finding out what we can call their profile of expression. That is, what proteins do they contain? What are they making? So this profiling gives you pictures that look like this. And I'm showing you, this is actually quite a complicated graph. Um, and I'm not going to explain to you how, how it's made. But I will explain to you what you're, what you're looking at and how you interpret this. Now, there's lots of letters and numbers here. You can ignore all of that. There are two graphs. There's one at the top and there's one at the bottom. These are not representing, by the way, uh, embryos or something like that. The shape of them, the fact that that looks a bit like some weird creature with its mouth open, is of no consequence whatsoever. I mean, it's kind of cute, but it's definitely not meaningful. This one here looks like a thumb, you know, with, going like this, you know, thumbs down, uh, which might be appropriate, I guess, given that it was deleted. But it, again, it has no significance. They are simply uh, representations of this profiling experiment, right? Profiling, is, it's a bad term for people. I mean, we don't like to be profiled. But we're profiling cells here by knowing what they make. Okay. Now, every dot here, and those of you near the front will see this as a mass of dots of different colors, is a cell. So, you know, we have one, two, three, four, hundreds of cells here, thousands probably. Um, and they're laid out so that those that are most similar to each other are closer together, and those that are more different are further apart. And then they're colored according to some kind of boundary regions where we've turned them from a continuous distribution into a categorization. Okay, and obviously this is uh, a bit of a tricky thing to do because you've got to make a judgment where those boundaries are going to be, and that's very much like the way that we categorize people, to be honest. We put them into, into, into groups with somewhat artificial boundaries between them, for, often for practical reasons. So, cells that are close together are similar. And it turns out that these guys over here, on the left, at the top and the bottom, are the cells that are multiplying to produce the cells of the brain. We call them progenitors, uh, and that word's written there. And that means they're dividing very, very rapidly to make the brain cells. These cells over here on the right are the nerve cells, the purple ones. I've written here excitatory neurons. So we're going from dividing cells to mature cells over here. 
Now, the reason for showing you this is to point out the difference, because something has happened here following the deletion of PAC-6, which we don't see in the control. We've created a whole new type of cell. So it would seem, anyway, as far as this, this experiment is concerned. We've made all these yellow, pink, and orange cells down here. And that's what happens when we delete PAC-6. We get cells doing the wrong thing. You've taken away this control, this high-level control mechanism telling these genes what to do. Take it away, and we get a completely erroneous type of cell, so it would seem. But it turns out, actually, these cells are very similar to the cells in that green area that I showed you before. The area, remember, I called it the thalamus. I said it's where all this information comes through to get up to the, to the cortex of the brain, all this sensory information. These cells actually turn out to be like those green cells. And that means that we've, we've minimized the difference between those two areas now. Right? By removing this factor, we've made them more similar. So, just by, uh, in, incidentally, and, and, and this may interest some of you, um, we actually, as I said, we did that work in mice, but you can do similar things in humans, but obviously not in, uh, in, in embryos. We can do it in what we call mini-brains or organoids, and you may have heard about these being made in the news, and, and so on, they crop up from time to time in news programs. We can take cells from humans, or we can immortalize them, make them into stem cells, and then we can actually make them into nerve cells, and we can make them, in a, in a dish, make little mini-brains. And here's an example of one. There's the experimenter's thumb, and there's a little mini-brain there, and that's uh, made of human cells. And if you cut it, the sections look like the, the very, very early fetal brain. So we can do that, and then what we can do is, in that case, we can mutate the PAC-6 gene and see what happens. And what do we find? We find the same thing happens uh, as happened in the mouse. Here we have it there. There's uh, the control over there on, on the left-hand side. It, the shapes are different now. There are lots more dots. That's the control there. That's the deletion there. And you see all this purple magenta, blue stuff over here on the right, that's appeared in following the mutation, and it wasn't there in the control. So we've converted cells into the wrong type. Uh, just like we did in the mouse, the same thing has happened in the human. Okay, so let's have a think about what we've done there then. What we've done, to go back to this picture, Normally, we have a difference between the red and the green area. We've taken away PAC-6, and what happens is that this boundary region here now becomes more similar across it. So whereas that was red and that was green, the red area has become more like the green area. Okay, so it's a bit like having France and Germany, and now Germany's a bit more French. <laughs> That's basically what's happened. So let's go back and think about our making our connections then, making these, these links, these, uh, the, these growth cones navigating through this, this space. What do they do? Well, this experiment here, this is a photograph of an experiment in which uh, a dye which traces axons has been placed into the green area. And you see there's a big lump of uh, dye placed there at the top of the picture. And then these hair-like structures coming around here and bending into the red area. That's the boundary zone, the dotted line in the middle. You can see that there, there are hundreds, thousands of them making their way from the green to the red. So I haven't colored it. This would be uh, red. That would be green there. And these are all the axons coming around with their growth cones at the end, navigating their way through. And what they're doing, probably, we think, is saying, oh, there's a difference. We need to head into the red area. The red area is good for us. It's making these attractive substances. 
So, let's think about now, let's look at the result of experiment where we delete the PAC6 gene. We've made it, you know, more green, made the red more greenish. What happens? This is what happens. They have a shot, not many of them, but basically they don't know where to go. A lot of them don't even come over the border. Right? It's like, you know, if you're French and you really fancy going to Germany, uh, suddenly it's a bit more French and you think, okay, I'm not going to bother. So, you know, they, they just don't know what to do, apparently. So what the brain is doing is creating these territories which are different to each other. And that provides information which these growing connections use to link up. And that seems to be one of the most fundamental ways in which the nervous system is developing. Now, of course, this is looking at a very basic level at just one connection. And I said there are hundreds of trillions of them. So there's got to be a lot more complexity to it. But you can imagine that if this holds at this early stage, as development goes on, these areas are going to get divided and subdivided, and our territories and our brain countries, if you like, are going to get split up, and that's providing more differences and more information that these cone, growth cones can use to navigate with ever greater precision towards their eventual targets. Okay, so I'm going to uh, switch now to think about the environment. So the baby's born, the environment will have affected them already, okay, in the, in the, in, in the fetus, in the, in the, in the uterus, the, the environment is there, the mother, uh, the hormonal, the, the uh, whatever it is, uh, whatever the mother is uh, eating, whatever's around in the surrounding environment has the potential to affect the developing fetus. After birth, the environment starts to get more and more and more complicated. By the time you hit your teenage years, your environment is immense. I mean, you know, the complexity of it is, is vast. Trying to work out things like, you know, whether it's a good idea to play computer games all the time or not. It's so complicated, you know, because it's in an environmental context which is so diverse. So what do we know about the environment? And the answer actually is actually remarkably little. Um, that, now, we, we suspect a lot about the environment and environmental factors in brain development. But what we actually know for sure is a lot less than what we suspect and certainly a lot less and you'll read about it if you if you scan the, the web. So to go back to many brains then, before birth we can use these to actually try and find evidence as to whether substances are toxic or potentially deleterious to the developing brain. We've got these human brains, mini brains, growing in a dish, they grow to a certain stage, and one of the uses that people put them to is to put them into different environments and see whether it has an impact on them. And there's a lot of work that now that's being done on that. We personally, uh, I personally and, and our group don't, don't work on that. Some of these experiments can get extremely, uh, well, I don't know how, what you'd call them, actually, a bit obscure. This is probably the most obscure one, which is to stick them into space, uh, which is definitely changing their environment. <laughs> Um, and this is a quote from a scientist who said, many brains can give you very valuable information on the cells that might appear when you have a baby up there. Whether, you know, this, this, is, a, this, this is the most hand-waving of hypotheses, I, I don't know. But that, what you're looking at is an incubator within which uh, human mini-brains are growing, and this is in the space station. I don't know what they're expecting to learn from it, but... Um, it's kind of, kind of interesting, I suppose. So what we do know, though, is that the brain, when it is born, and these connections, these trillions of connections have linked up, we know that they are plastic. And this is really the, the thing that has intrigued scientists for a long time. You're born 
and, and your genes are not going to help you to get this machine inside your head into full working order. You have got to experience uh, the world around you. You have to have sensory perception. All of that has to pile in there to mold your brain. And how does it do it? And we do know something about this, in principle anyway. It doesn't do it by making those growth cones go to other places, because they've kind of already done that in a, in a lot of situations, not entirely, there's still quite a bit to go. It's not through telling growth cones, you know, making growth cones go to different places. It's through affecting the connections that they make and strengthening or weakening them through experience. So these synapses are, um, they, they involve the transmission of electrical activity from one cell to another. They were the bright spots in that thing I showed earlier. Electrical activity comes down one uh, nerve cell, and then there's a release of chemicals at the junction, we call these neurotransmitters, which stimulate receptors on the post, we call this the postsynaptic cell, which then activates activity on this side too. Now what we know is that one of the most critical properties of synapses is that they change their strength, they change their morphology, they change their size, depending on how active they are. So if we activate this synapse a lot, it will grow in strength, and if we don't activate it much, it won't. It will actually shrink. So let's make it shrink. Lower activity makes it shrink. I mean, that's not a particularly uh, <laughs> good illustration. It doesn't just kind of go... Uh, it, it, changes its proteins, and it diminishes its functional strength. It might make it look a bit smaller, that would be difficult to assess. If we make it very active, then it will get stronger. And so that's the principle on which our brain's connectivity is molded during uh, the early stages of life, and actually it's the basis of learning and memory throughout life. But it's very, very important for even the most fundamental aspects of our perception early in life. So the way we see things is affected by our ability to see them. And we know this because if you are born with cataracts, congenital cataracts, after a certain stage, if you haven't had them removed, you will never gain the ability to use the eye which had that cataract because the connections in the brain, they will do the, the, with the shrinking side of that demonstration there. They'll disappear because you're not using them. So it's kind of use it or lose it at that stage of your life. Later, you know, these things become uh, more localized to certain bits of the brain and they become more relevant for learning and memory. So I think of this a bit like, again, going back to us and using the analogy of our mobile phones. I'm sure you've all been extremely irritated, I know I am, by going on to like book a, a holiday or something, only to then be bombarded by you know, suggestions for where you might want to go or information about that country or something. Because that's what your mobile phones do. They look at what activity you're doing and they strengthen that. And that's exactly what the brain does. You use those connections, they get stronger. So in this diagram here, going back to this from the start, you can see all these flickering synapses in here. If this cell on the, on the left there, that red cell, starts to become very active, these are going to start glowing like crazy. These synapses here are going to start to increase their strength. So every time they get used, they're stronger. And whatever it is that these cells are doing, whether they're driving you to do something or they're enabling you to see color or to perceive things in a certain way, they're getting stronger. And that's enabling the brain to then recognize that the next time it sees it, so that the baby is learning, and then later in life, the, adult, the adolescent is learning uh, to do that. Okay, so let me just sum up then uh, with a few statements. Uh, genes tell cells, genes tell cells what brain cell type to become. Our genome creates these territories, these countries, if you like, within our early embryonic fetal brain. Though 
brain cell types, they, they create these territories uh, where cells of similar type cluster together. And then these, uh, this information that's con contained within that territorial layout is used by cells to connect themselves together in meaningful ways before finally our environment refines uh, these connections. Okay, so I'll leave you with a picture of people in my group. We did this work on a sunny day on the meadows in Edinburgh. Um, and uh, the people who funded the research, MRC UK, and the Simons Initiative for the Developing Brain. Uh, and thank you very much for listening, and I hope you enjoyed it. Just check the train times. <laughs> Five minutes past nine. So, what do you think of that? <coughs> Questions? Come on then. I think there's something smart to ask. <laughs> yes, at the back. Hi, Hi. Uh, Bob Kerr here. Uh, I was just wondering, you said that you've been working on this one particular gene for 30 years, mm -hmm. and there's an awful lot of them. Uh, what's the uh, likelihood that now that you've gone through this, in, this work, that finding other, uh, the way that genes work in other places, you, you'll be able to find out what they do? So, yeah. uh, did you hear that question or shall yeah. I repeat it? Repeat it. You've been working on the, this gene, this one gene for 30 years, and now uh, David has some understanding of what he does. Okay, so basically, what's the likelihood of taking that knowledge to then discover how other genes affect other bits of the brain? In other words, what have you learned from what you learned? Yeah, yeah? No, that's a great, that's a great question. Um, so, the the genes that we study, and I would say this is probably true for uh, all the people that work in this area, and there are, there are hundreds of groups around the world who work on this type of gene. Um, the, the, the reason that, that we focus so much on these genes is because I think when we learn about how they work, it, it opens ways of thinking about how other genes work that then allow us to more quickly discover what they do because we already have a better idea of what they probably are doing. Just to give you an example, um, one of the things which... I, I mean, for various reasons, it took a, a while for the penny to drop uh, about this particular gene, is that I, uh, you know, people often think of, and I think this is a very human trait, to think of things that are in control. We think of things that are in control, like people who are in control, as being, as telling other people what to do. And in fact, I use the word to tell there. Uh, so they, it's a positive instruction. It's like, do this, do that, move there, go there, don't do that. They, we don't so often do that last thing and say, don't do that. We do often to our kids. But, you know, leaders of countries don't tend to go around telling people what not to do. They tend to tell them what to do. So the, the, this, this particular gene, I think, actually is telling cells not to do something, which is the wrong thing. And that sounds an incredibly passive thing to sit there saying, no, don't do that, without telling them what to do. Um, you know, it's not kind of, I suppose when you're teaching kids and things, you, you, you tend to give them instructions, but then you stop, you put barriers and limits and things. But if you only put the limits, it's kind of they're bouncing around in there and you're just seeing what happens. Um, so we didn't really think of it for a while, but I think that dawned on us. And now, of course, we're starting to think maybe a lot of the other, it makes sense that maybe a lot of others of these genes, that's what they're doing. They're actually stopping certain things from happening rather than telling cells exactly what to do. Uh, so that's just one example. I'm not sure if that was a terribly clear explanation. But, but anyway, the bottom line is that, yeah, I think that you can learn concepts by studying one gene that are transferable to others, yeah. Yes. Yeah. When you altered um, the pancreas, you, you are acting as a, an environmental detriment to that gene. Yeah, yeah. very much so, yes. <laughs> so, the, the more I hear talks like yours, uh, talking about nature and nurture, genes and environment, yeah. the more it seems to me that 
the envir environment is actually altering gene expression. Yeah. And that more and more we'll be thinking more and more about genes and their expression and perhaps less about the environment as something other than its work through genes. Yeah. No, so, did you hear that question or? Yes? Shall I repeat it? Because I'm not sure I can remember it. <laughs> yeah. But, but yeah. yes. I think I think what you're saying, you're making the he's making the point, I think, um, that these things are very circular. Um, and we do have this tendency to think nature, nurture, gene, environment. It's quite an artificial way, I think, of thinking about it. Um, you're absolutely right. I mean, the, the genes create the environment which then affects the gene expression and so on and so forth. So, I mean, actually, at the moment, I'm in the middle of writing a book about, it's called Misbuilding Brains, which is about, um, you know, all sorts of uh, disorders of development and, and diverge, neurodivergence and all these things. And writing what you've just said is horrendously, I'm trying to compose those elements of the book to explain the complexity and the backwards and forwards and the circularities and the, you know, what's environment. Because, of course, you're right, in the environment of that cell is me manipulating it. Um, in the environment of that growth cone going through the brain, you know, it, it's territory to the environment um, for that growth cone. So it depends what your perspective is, what your... Yeah, what, what, where you, you're sitting in the whole complex network of interactions. I think that's what you're. I think that's the point you're making. Is that? Yeah. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. 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 Great. Great. Great point. Yeah. Yes, David. I know that some even very simple animals have very simple brains. Yeah. Things like slugs. Yeah. Is there a threshold of simplicity below which mechanisms are fundamentally different? Um, Did you hear that one? Yes. Um, gosh. Uh, I mean, I'm thinking down to, well, you know, obviously you're, you're, you're talking about multicellular organisms. I mean, when, when you get down into single cell organisms, things change. Um, I don't think so. I mean, even, even down to the simplest of things, like the hydra, where people have looked at, at very simple behaviors, you get these similar synaptic principles of plasticity uh, there. They're a lot easier to study, of course, because you're only dealing with a, a two, three, four, five, six neurons in a little circuit. Um, but I think the same principles hold. So in evolution, I think, I think evolution created nerve cells a long time ago, and they haven't changed much since. I actually have a question. I was reading my uh, Google News at breakfast this morning and I saw an article there, apparently a breakthrough, where some people had mapped all of the connections within a fruit fly's brain for the first time. And they said that this was a big deal in your field. Did you see that? Or do I know more about this than you? <laughs> <laughs> On that specific point, you know, more about it than I do. I, I didn't. I, I didn't see that. Um, uh, I was looking it up. So yeah. I was hoping David would ask. Someone ask oh, another right. question while I look it up. <laughs> yeah. Somebody had a hand up over here. Yeah. Yes. Um, it was just you referenced quite a lot that our own lives, technology, and society uh, to explain the brain. How likely is it that we subconsciously plan? the designs of our brain into the things that we create as humans, since it is like the origin of our thoughts to begin with. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know the answer to that. That's, that's a really intriguing question, actually. Um, I don't really know quite how to answer that, other than a hunch, I suppose, which is that my hunch would be that quite a lot of our, you know, we create things quite a lot based on the way that we are. I mean, I'm thinking about, you know, the most obvious analogy for the brain is our computers. But, I mean, whether they actually, I mean, they can be made to behave like our brain, definitely. And um, I guess whether we've designed them that way because our brain is the way it is, which I think is what you're asking, mm, or is it just that that's the way that our... Actually, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, what do you think? Uh, I feel like 
the more I learn, the more I see patterns in nature. It's almost as if like there's a blueprint. Yeah. Um, it just I'm so uneducated on the subject, but I feel like you see these blueprints and you see them in our society, societal structure, but as well as in the animal kingdom within the final workings of biology. Yeah. It almost seems like there is like almost this DNA code that represents right. itself over and over again. Okay. It just has a way that that's so prevalently ingrained in us that it even comes out in a societal sense and like human structure and psychology. Yes. But again, just a just a. Not yes, actually, I think that that's. I think I think on that point about the societal construction and so, on, very likely that is based on the way that our brains work, mm. because you know we make assumptions about the world around us every split second. Mm. We have to, otherwise we couldn't comp we couldn't deal with all the information coming in. So we assume there's a room here with a bunch of people in it, and we kind of check up now and again. That's okay. That's what our brains do. It's not analysing every split second what's in front of us. So that means we assume things, which is why we can get tricked mm. and we get fooled by, by illusions and whatever. Um, but it also means we, we as humans, to make sense of the world, we, have to, we really have to categorise because we're looking for patterns all the time. Mm. Patterns in people's mm. behaviours, which is why when we see somebody behaving in a certain way, we jump to assumptions and often they're wrong. And so, you know, societies are often created based on incorrect assumptions simply because that's what we do. That's the way our brains have evolved. Mm. And they couldn't function otherwise. Thanks. That's a good question. Yes? There's been discovery recently about the microbiome in the brain itself. Oh, really? Um, because obviously we've always sort of understood that there's never been any sort of microbiome in the actual I think this plays an important part, perhaps, in the way that your connections are being made. Because I saw there that when you removed the pack six, mm -hmm. there were still connections going through. Yeah, they make so sure. So what, what do you think is driving that, that there's like this, this base instinct of this that's trying to go? Yeah, I, I think that's probably right. There probably is a base instinct. I mean, there's, there's multiple sources of information, and by removing one gene, you haven't taken them all away. I didn't know about the microbiome. And the mic the microbiome is, is all the organisms that surround us, and obviously we have a lot, I mean we have trillions of them right now inside our body and mainly in our gut. I didn't know about in the yeah, brain. Yeah, there's, there's, there's right, okay, well I need to look that up, but yeah, no, that's fascinating, yeah, 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 I mean the microbiome is, is critical, yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. I see your funding's been uh, from the Medical Research Council. Yeah. Is there some hope that you would find something medically significant? And have you found anything medically significant or any of your colleagues? Yeah, so the, um, I mean, the Medical Research Council funds a range of activities uh, that range from pretty basic science, which might one day uh, have benefit to quite applied. This, this is somewhere in the middle, I would say. The, the PAC-6 gene... Uh, there are quite a lot of people around who have mutations of the PAC6 gene, and it affects the eye and it possibly affects the development of their brain, but we don't really know exactly on the latter. The eye is, is definitely affected, and there's quite a lot known about that. So I've met a lot of these people, um, and they, uh, you know, they, they, I mean, they lead normal lives. It's not a particularly devastating mutation, but if it's having effects, they are quite subtle. And I think this kind of work gives us clues as to what to look for. And if we can figure out why the PAC6 gene is a uh, mutation has these kinds of effects, there might be some way in which we could intervene to help them that we haven't thought of yet. I mean, we're not going to correct the gene. Um, I mean, for some genes, you might be able to with gene therapy. Uh, but for this particular one, you probably wouldn't do that because it's not such a major effect on, on the person. Uh, other work we've done might be closer to having a, a, you know, having an impact on thinking of new therapeutic approaches. But at the end of the day, the output from our work is very much, this is new knowledge, and it's for other people to maybe apply it. Did, did you want to come back? You look like you're going to come back on that. Yeah. No, I wasn't going to come back on it. I, I was just wondering... If 
about the pack 16 and switching it off. Um, what did you use for that? And okay. is, it, is this a kind of purely scientific yeah. thing, or are you using chemicals that are in the environment? No, no, it's a, it's a, a very, very specific targeted um, thing. It, it uses a technique that's known as CRISPR-Cas. You might, some you may have heard of it. Sometimes it gets mentioned in the news. It's a way of basically engineering a very specific change at a point in the genome. So it's not like you add a chemical or a something to make it do that. It, it's a scientific procedure. Yeah. It's the gentleman over there. Um, when you removed PAC6, was there any other dominant controlling gene um, which showed up? Um, you mean replacing it maybe or something like that? Uh, no, uh, no, nothing like that. Um, and I think that's because, I mean, in some cases, it's, it's a good point, because in some cases, you, you know, when you mutate a gene, others come and compensate, and they kind of take a more dominant role. Uh, but with this kind of gene, it's so fundamental, I think, that if you lose it, uh, the, the, I mean, if you lose all pac 6 in a human, it's incompatible with life. So... The people I'm talking about in answer to the previous question have one copy that's still functioning. It's just they've got a lot less of it. Okay, so there's nothing that comes in to take over or dominate. No. There's the Nature article on mapping the fruit fly spray. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, that's a beautiful picture. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> okay. Uh, there's a question at the back actually. I think you've answered my question. I was uh, going to be asking whether it was the mutation of the PAC6 gene that was what um, the, the study had been about, with not just the, the normal gene. Yes. I mean, we used the mutation in order to find out what it does. I mean, it's a bit of a crude approach. It's, it's probably the first thing you do. I mean, we have done other things where we've made the gene more active, done the opposite. Um, but, you know, find out what something does by smashing it up isn't, isn't super, uh, you know, elegant in a way, but it's what is the best first step, because it gives you an indication of what's happening. And it also uh, kind of models the mutation that you get then and what effect that, that affects people. Okay, I got one last question from me. It's um, a random it's one, off. but it's about <laughs> connections. Because one thing that interests me is random connections between people. You worked at Berkeley, yeah, mm -hmm. on genes, genetics, yeah. Yeah. in the 80s. In the 80s. Did you happen to know a lady called Kimmon Schillander, who was a mathematician who worked with uh, uh, Craig Ventman on the Human Genome Project? She uh, was one of the co-authors of the famous paper. I went and heard Craig Ventner speak, but I never met the lady that you're referring to. No, um, Just a, a yeah. random friend of mine from the time I worked in the States. <laughs> yeah. Just wondered if, you know, because quite often you have these random people that you know in common. Yeah, what was yeah. the six degrees of separation? Yeah. <laughs> right, um, if there's no more questions, David, can I ask you to do the usual vote of thanks? Well, friends, um, a few years ago, when I was an undergraduate in Montreal, uh, a wise friend of mine persuaded me to go and listen to lectures of Professor Donald Hebb, who in those days was a very frail elderly gentleman, but still very much on the ball. And he explained, it was more reminiscences than lectures, telling us really, though he wouldn't have put it as, as um, quite those terms, how he and Wilder Penfield, between them, laid the foundations for modern neurology. And I wouldn't have said that I understood what he was saying, um, but it, what it did do was extend the horizons of my ignorance. And that's really what we're about. That's what curious minds are all about. We know a bit more, and we realize there's much, much, much more to learn. And the neurologists come along uh, quite a bit since those far-off days in Montreal. Uh, my knowledge has increased, but the subject has increased enormously faster. 
So the horizons of my ignorance are even bigger than they ever were then. <laughs> and I think this evening, I feel as though my horizons, both of knowledge and of ignorance, have been very therapeutically stretched. <laughs> and that's what we came here for this evening. So I'd like to thank David for doing that for us, and I suppose to us as well. I invite you to join me in thanking him in the usual way.